book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. We were just about done with Ephesians when God led us to start Philippians, the next book, and we're already a good ways into that, but now we're going to catch a couple things that we missed at the end of the book of Ephesians. And today is 9-11. We talk about 9-11 a lot over the years. And it's hard to believe that we're pretty close to a quarter century now passing since that day that seems so fresh in all of our minds. And it's just a testament to how... um, what an impact it's made upon us that it still seems like it could have been just very recently that that happened. And with what we're asking for in America today by opening up our borders, by not checking uh, people, by all the known gotaways at our border, uh, and then the hundreds that we've identified at the border that are on the terror watch list And we've still allowed in hundreds of those. And then who knows how many of those are on the Godaway list. I mean, if you were coming into a country as as an illegal and you were a terrorist, isn't it more likely that you would be part of the Godaways than part of the ones that just surrender at the border because you know they'll let you in? Um, you wouldn't want to be found out. And so if there's hundreds that we know of, there could be thousands, maybe more than that, when you're talking 18 million this administration has allowed in. Maybe even the word thousands isn't adequate to describe it, especially when on this day we remember what can be done by a dozen people working together. And and so on this day when we remember something that's nearly a quarter century old, but it seems so fresh to us, just remember how fresh it was when you woke up the next day. Remember 9-12 and imagine that that's how we wake up tomorrow because of some other great catastrophe that has happened. Remember that our enemies around the world actually want us dead or want us greatly reduced, greatly reduced in in stature among the nations. And remember what has happened to Judeo-Christian people in history that have been uh, that have been plagued by issues like slavery. God's people in slavery in Egypt. They were oppressed. They wanted they wanted them pushed down and held down. God's people taken into slavery in Babylon when they were led away from Jerusalem was burned and the gates and the temple was destroyed and they were led away as slaves in a foreign land, pushed down. And no, you can't pray and no, you can't worship. Um, Slavery. No. Slavery is no... um, mystery to us in the United States of America, because within our own borders, the tragedy of slavery occurred, and occurred for a long time. Um, Usually when we think of slavery, we think of those issues. We think of Egypt, we think of Babylon, or we think of the United States, but there's a lot of slavery all over the world. What we don't realize is that as we study these epistles of Paul, we don't realize that the Roman Empire had basically made slaves out of a whole lot of the people that they had conquered. They had um, some, some people that were just 
their subjects and then some that they had literally enslaved. Perhaps six million people living in the Roman Empire were slaves. And with that in mind, look at Ephesians 6 and verse number 5, which says, servants... What's another word for servants here? Slaves. Be obedient. You say, well, slavery, sla the word slave has a much darker connotation than servant. A servant might be somebody who is serving a meal. Um, Paul called himself a slave, didn't he? That's the term that he used. And whose slave was he? Yeah, he said, I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. But elsewhere, Paul said that back when my name was Saul, I was also a slave. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So verse 5 begins, servants or slaves, be obedient to them that are your what? Masters. Yeah, that's the word that we use. In conjunction with a, a slave, masters, according to the flesh, be obedient to them, it says, with fear and trembling, as unto Christ. Um, verse number 9, and ye masters, do the same things unto them. Okay, we'll come back to the text in a moment. But... Um, I want you to zero in on verse number 8. It says, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. The word bond there is speaking of those that were in slavery. And free, those who uh, were not in slavery, many of them people who held slaves themselves. So... Um, they're supposed to be obedient to their masters, and it specifies what masters. Masters according to the flesh. Masters down here on earth. It says in verse number 6, not with eye service. That means not doing their work with an eye on the clock. Have you ever worked that way? Have you ever not worked that way? <laughs> Let's be honest. We look at the clock. How much longer? I remember back in school, living for recess, and then after recess, living for lunch, and then living for 3 o'clock, you know? And, and then you start working, and it's the same thing. Eye service. Eye on the clock. Or eye service could mean that you're working only when the boss is looking. Eye service. Doing it just... Uh, to please him. And then it uses the word men, men pleasers uh, there in verse 6. As men pleasers um, buttering up the boss. So same, same idea there. So you can take these things that we're looking at tonight and you can apply them to work. You can apply them to the employer-employee relationship. But in that day... Paul was thinking about the slave-master relationship. And though it has an application to us today, it definitely does. I think it's good to work through this whole thing. How do I feel about this? Paul telling masters and slaves how they're supposed to uh, interact with each other. Well, first of all, the Bible is not con condoning slavery. Certainly not. Uh, Paul recognized that there was slavery, however. And remember, this whole section started back in chapter 5 and verse 21. The whole section on submission was about, verse 21 says, uh, uh, submitting yourselves one to another. And then it goes into wives submitting and husbands submitting and parents submitting, right, and children submitting. And now it's talking about Slaves, servants, um, employees, masters, bosses, that sort of thing. 
when we talked about submitting in chapter 5 and submitting one to another, that was okay. We were okay with that. That's okay on Sunday to talk about that. But how about Monday when you go to work? Submitting to your boss? Now, we need to work through this slavery thing. Perhaps six million slaves in the Roman Empire. And you'll notice in the Bible, Christianity never directly confronted, never directly attacked the evil of slavery. What the gospel did, rather than confronting slavery and saying slavery is wrong, it reached down to the slave in his degradation and lifted him up and showed him true freedom, what true freedom was. Uh, the very nature of the gospel condemns slavery. The nature of it condemns it, where it didn't even have to be said. And the gospel eventually broke the shackles of slavery uh, without even preaching against it. Multitudes of slaves came to Christ. We read about a bunch of them in Romans chapter uh, 16, and just in secular history, uh, we read about that a lot. Uh, we all know that slavery is wrong. The Bible's not condoning it here, but isn't it interesting that the gospel, uh, uh, the gospel um, never directly attacks slavery. Instead, it freed people in their minds uh, from that. Now, have you ever pondered, if you lived during the Civil War, which side you would have been on? I don't mean which side of the Mason-Dixon line you would have been on. I don't mean would you have been with the North or the South? <clears throat> I mean, which side would you have been on? Don't you know there was a lot of people in the South who disagreed with what was going on in the South and weren't for that, just as there were people in the North who weren't necessarily with the North. Both sides had trouble rallying their own troops because not everyone was in agreement even on their side of the line. Have you ever wondered <clears throat> which side you would have been on. It's an interesting thought uh, to ponder. Well, um, our text says, servants be obedient to them that are your masters. And Christianity did not recommend revolution. Uh, it preached a gospel that was more revolutionary than any revolution could be. Something bigger, a bigger picture than just a revolution and an overthrow. Uh, that's what Lincoln did, and that's a good thing. But don't you know revolu revolution always has some side effects too and some lingering bad effects, and the United States is proof positive of that. Otherwise, I'd say, aren't you glad the Civil War's over so there's no more racism in America? Aren't you glad the war is over so there's no such thing as prejudice anymore? It didn't do away with those things. There's side effects. There's lingering bitterness and hatred uh, through the centuries. But what the gospel did was something bigger and better, breaking down the middle wall of partition and, uh, and saving souls. So um, this passage said, Servants, be obedient to your masters according to the flesh, because their masters, they were masters only of their bodies. According to the flesh, only their bodies uh, did they own. And then it says, in singleness of heart. In singleness of heart. Do you see that at uh, the end? Um, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Back up to verse 5, the end, the last phrase. In singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. What does it mean to do something with singleness of heart? Well, no two-facedness, right? Not kissing the ring in their presence and then stabbing of the back when they're away. Um, as unto Christ, it says at the end of verse 5. Um, most slaves, many slaves, worked as little as possible only when the master was watching. But if you become a slave of Christ, you realize Christ has made you free and you want to please your master. An earthly master can only control your body 
the slaves of Christ have yielded their souls to him. And so Paul called himself the bond slave of Jesus Christ and shows that the gospel is more revolutionary than any revolution could have been. Then notice the phrase, with good will, doing service. That's in verse 7. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. This means attitude, the right attitude. Uh, the hardships of work life are more easily passed over when you have a good attitude. Slavery. No more slavery in the U.S., right? Well, that is, unless you're talking about slavery to debt, there's a lot of debt slavery in the United States. No slavery in America, unless you're talking about slavery to porn. Uh, porn has got a hold on this country. Crime, drugs, alcohol. Actually, there's still slavery all around us. And the need for the gospel to free us and to introduce us to our new master is greater than ever. Saul, Paul, before he was Paul, was Saul, right? Saul of Tarsus said, I was slave to an ideology. I was a slave when I was a Pharisee. I was a slave to that kind of thinking. And when he came to Christ, he said, I was made free from that. And he yielded to a new master, and he immediately said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, or master, what wilt thou have me to do? Maybe you've heard of the missionary named William Carey. William Carey was a shoemaker who answered the call to go off as a foreign missionary and someone asked him one time, um, what's your trade? And they were asking him to humiliate him because he was a shoemaker. They wanted to embarrass him because he was a shoemaker. What is your business? And he said this, my business is serving the Lord, and I make shoes to pay the bills. Look at verse 9 now. Ye masters, do the same things unto them. In other words, what we've just challenged the servants to do, to submit, masters need to submit. Forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Who's this verse talking to? Masters. And it said, you have a master too. Your master, capital M, also in heaven. Neither is the respect of persons with him. So if you're an employer, before Christ, you're just another man. God's no respecter of persons. You also have a master. Masters aren't supposed to be threatening, this verse says. It says that masters are not supposed to take advantage of their position as master to abuse their power. In the presence of Christ, the ground is level. We all stand on the same footing. This is what Paul is saying here. Now, there's an interesting book of the Bible that's pretty much all about slavery. And you know what that book is? The book of Philemon. Philemon. Some people call it Philemon. The epistle to Philemon. Philemon was a master who had a slave. His slave's name was Onesimus. And Onesimus ran away from Philemon. The slave ran away from the master. And according to the law of that day, Philemon, the master, could have put him to death. However, Onesimus found the Lord. He trusted Christ. He was born again. When Onesimus got saved, Paul sent him back to his master. He said, you need to go back and submit to your master. And he sent a letter with him. And here's what he said in Philemon, verses 15 and 16. It says, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, special to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh 
and in the Lord. What a picture there. You've got master and slave. Let me put it a different way. Capital and labor. And they're both believers. And so Paul points out, you're both brothers as a result of that. Interesting. Here's a quote from Gilbert Chester, Chesterton. Or Chesterson. Gilbert Chesterson said, and maybe you've heard this quote before. His quote's more famous than his name. He said, It's not that in America Christianity has been tried and found wanting. The problem is in America it's never really been tried. He's talking about the Christian experiment of what will the gospel do to a nation. Now, I would argue that it probably was pretty thoroughly tried in our early days. There's so much evidence of the evangelization of, of um, the United States uh, from the very beginning. But it didn't stick too long. And so that's still kind of the problem today. What he was saying is that we're not really trying the Christian experiment anymore. It's not tried and found wanting. It's just not tried anymore. It's, it's kept behind stained glass windows. It's kept within our walls these days. And if Christianity doesn't move out of the sanctuary and out into the secular, then something's really going to go wrong. And that's what we see in America today. So what did Christianity do in Rome, where there was so much slavery? And in the Roman Empire, where there was so much slavery? Well, a lot of slaves got saved. And if you look at the example of what happened with Onesimus and his master Philemon, it really put an end to the master-slave relationship even before the Roman Empire fell. The gospel worked in that way, and it will work today. Now, if you go to the Old Testament book of Ruth, in, you don't need to turn, but uh, remember who Ruth worked for? What was his name? Yeah, Boaz. If you read the book of Ruth, spe specifically in chapter 2, it says that every day Boaz, the boss, the master, if you will, greeted his workers with, the Lord be with you. And it says they would always reply, and the Lord bless thee. That really is the picture of employer-employee, the way that it should be done done right in that way. If you let a man share the results of his labor, he will work better, he will work harder. If you give more than just responsibilities, but you also give privilege, that's good. And it really helps when the boss knows the Lord and is submitted to the Lord. It really ha helps when the employee is a Christian as well. So in verse 9, let's look at it one more time. It says, you, you masters do the same things under them, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Basically, the same phrase appears to every group that we've studied in Ephesians, chapter 5 and 6. The same phrase, or a version of the same phrase. This all started with a challenge to wives to submit to their husbands. And how did it say for wives to submit to their husbands? As unto, as unto the Lord. That's in 522. And then it tells husbands, uh, it says submitting yourselves one to another, so husbands are to submit to their wives in that way, as unto the Lord. But then it's specific with husbands saying, love your wife how? Even as Christ loved the church. That's verse 25. Then when it tells children to obey their parents, in Ephesians 6, 1, it says, in the Lord, or as unto the Lord. And then when it tells parents to raise their children, it tells them how to raise them. How? In the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so no wonder now when it says servants be obedient as unto Christ, it puts it that way, as to the Lord. And now it tells masters, to serve their servants just as they are serving their master in heaven. Put another way, as to the Lord. Each and every one of us in submission to the Lord can submit to one another and, and have preference for one another 
and have a lot less problems uh, in our lives. And it all boils down to what Jesus said when he spoke to leaders. He was talking to his men who were arguing about which of them was the greatest, right? And he said, the best way to be a ruler or a leader is to be a servant. He that is greatest among you, let him be a servant. Think of all the great people in the Bible who were servants first before God made them into a ruler. As a matter of fact, who can you think of right now that was a servant first, but then they ended up being elevated into being a ruler? Yeah. David, for sure, was a servant. He did his, he did his work out with the flock, didn't he? Uh, he was doing simple things with the sheep before he even had to face the lion or the bear. God knew eventually he was going to have spears chucked at him. And he served in, in Saul's court, King Saul's court, right? Playing the lyre and, and uh, his harp and all of that. But it eventually ends up being king. Who else can you think of? Moses was a servant, ended up being the head of the land. Who else? Joseph is a great example, isn't he? Uh, there in Potiphar's and in prison. And then basically becoming the prime minister. Can you think of somebody else? Samuel would be a good example. And you know, Nehemiah comes to my mind. Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. He learned to serve. And God saw greatness where he sees it often. In submission, he sees greatness. And the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will do what? Give you a promotion. <laughs> the Bible puts it this way, he will lift you up. But that's what it means. He'll lift you up. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, Jesus said. So, uh, once in a while when you're witnessing to someone, they'll say, I don't believe in the Bible because it promoted slavery. You'll know better. You'll know better. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, tonight for the wonderful freedom that we find in you. And what a privilege it is to be called your servants. And Lord, we would willingly say, I am the bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is a good master, and a master not just according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Help us to serve you with our lives. We pray once again for our nation, for your protection over us, for space to repent for an awakening, for a revival. We pray for the unborn. We pray for your people, Israel. We pray for the lost. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.